everyone. I'm Dr. Aaron, your host of the Trial Site News podcast interview series. And today I will be chatting with Dr. Jeffrey Holt. Dr. Holt, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Yeah, so we are going to talk about, and this is very general, gene therapy in mice to restore hearing. That's that's the simplified version here. Um, but maybe first, can you can we start by you providing a brief introduction about you and the work you do? Yeah, sure. I run a, a basic science research lab at Boston Children's Hospital in, in Boston. Um, we're affiliated with Harvard Medical School. I'm part of the otolaryngology department. And the lab focuses on understanding the genes and proteins that are involved in the normal hearing process. But we also want to look at genetic mutations that cause hearing loss. And we want to translate what we've learned in that area, trying to develop gene therapies for genetic hearing loss. Fascinating stuff. So from the article that I read in the study that you guys uh, recently published, 16% of genetic hearing loss is caused by a pathogenic mutation in STRC which is a gene that codes for a protein called, and I may massacre this pronunciation, stereocillin? St That's spot on, That's you got it. <laughs> oh, wow, amazing. So let's start with the basics. Can you explain why that protein is important for hearing? Sure, so in the US, we think that there's about 30 million people who suffer clinically significant hearing loss, and probably half of that is due to genetic causes. When we look at the different genes that cause genetic hearing loss, there's at least 100 of those. And so we've kind of made a rank order list of the most common to the most rare. It turns out stereocillin falls number two on the list. So it's, it's a fairly common cause of genetic hearing loss, accounting for about 16% of cases. Interesting. So you used mice, you recreated this mutation, so to speak, in mice. Is exactly. That... Okay. Yeah. So we developed a mouse model. Um, we looked at the stereocillin gene and we in engineered a mutation in the mouse stereocillin. First, we wanted to see if the mouse was going to be a good model, and it turns out it is. It, it reproduces some of the same characteristics of humans who carry stereocillin mutation. So it's got a, a hearing loss. It's not profound, so they're not born deaf, but they've got what we would classify as a severe hearing loss. It affects, interestingly, a subset of the sensory cells in the inner ear. They're known as outer hair cells, and outer hair cells play a key role in the hearing process. They provide something known as cochlear amplification, which allows the ear basically to turn up the volume to soft sounds or turn down the volume to very loud sounds. And it also is involved in the tuning process. So allowing you to detect specific frequencies much more clearly. So without cochlear amplification, things like speech are harder to, to comprehend or understanding someone's voice in a noisy background, the cocktail party effect you may have heard of. Definitely. So I, we've all heard about gene therapy recently because of the vaccines for COVID-19 and uh, at least one of them that we have here but the, was a viral vector vaccine. Now you guys use something called a dual vector strategy to deliver the genetic code of the message to make this protein. Why did you have to use two and can you walk us through that process? Yeah, sure. So, so starting with the COVID vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is based on an adenovirus. For our gene therapy, we chose a similar vector. It's called adeno-associated virus, and this is one of the more common ones that's being used in gene therapies right now. It's got a great safety profile. It doesn't cause sickness or disease in humans. One of the disadvantages of adeno-associated virus is it's got a limited capacity. It can hold about 4,700 DNA base pairs. And so if you have a gene that's larger than that, then it won't fit. 
right? It's just a physical limitation. So it turns out the stereocilin gene has a capacity or, or the stereocilin gene is about 6.2, 6,200 base pairs. So too large to fit in a single adeno-associated viral vector. So we had to split it in half to make this work. So you split it in half and this is gonna be very basic. Those two have to come together at some point to create one message. Is, how, yes. do you, how did you figure that out? Well, that was the tricky part, um, splitting it in half and, and getting it to recombine into a full length protein was the goal. And what we discovered was when we split it in half, we tried it the first time and it didn't work. We tried it a, a couple of times, it didn't work. And one of the postdocs working on this project in my lab really came up with the, the key solution. And, and when we started thinking about it, it's really quite a simple solution. So if I can make an analogy, imagine you've got a, a Christmas gift that's too big to fit in a box. And so you decide to take it apart, put two halves each in a separate box. But one of the boxes has the address you wanna send this to and the other doesn't have the address. The recipient might only receive one half and not the second half and therefore they're not gonna get a functional present, right? So that's what happened with stereocilin. We realized there was a signal sequence, kind of like an address telling the cell which part of the cell this thing should be shipped to. And so my postdoc took that signal sequence, stuck it on both halves, and we found that they both made it to the proper destination within the cell, combined, reassembled to make the full length protein. Wow, that's so neat. It's just... <laughs> um... Kudos to your postdoc for figuring that out, by the way. That, that's, fa that's fascinating. Yeah, that's Olga Shubina Oliniak. She's the first author of the paper. Well, Olga, great job. Um, it's, it's really neat stuff. So you get this protein, it's made. Now, how do you assess, what do you use to measure if there is an improvement in hearing? Right. So in the mouse, we can do basically the same sort of hearing test that we would do in a human where we place a little scalp electrode on the back of the head and we can record the activity of the brain in response to sounds. So we'll play different frequencies of sounds, different pitches and different loudnesses. And so we can map out the hearing profile of the mice, much like you would a, a newborn baby. And, and can you give us some specific percentages or measurements to, for how well it worked? Sure. So a normal hearing mouse or human has a, an auditory threshold. This is the minimum detectable sound of about 20 decibels. If you've got this stereocilin mutation in the mice, anyway, they had thresholds that were around 80 decibels. So they could only hear very loud sounds. When we reintroduced stereocilin with a dual vector approach, we found that the thresholds came back down so that they could hear at the equivalent of normal levels in some of the best cases. Were there any side effects or anything that you saw that was concerning? We did not see any side effects. So that was good news. We actually injected the dual vectors into normal hearing mice just to see if it caused any problems, any toxicity. And so we, we didn't see any at this point. That's a really good sign. Of course, we'll wanna do a very thorough evaluation about the, the toxicity and, and pharmacology before we inject it into anybody's ears. So you patented this, I assume. It we did, we did. And we think that this could be a strategy that is useful for, for patients who carry stereocilin mutations. But we also think this general strategy of using the signal sequence to deliver a protein to the same location within a cell could be used for any of a number of very large genes that don't fit into a single AAV, a single viral vector. Wow, that's really, that's cool stuff. <laughs> cool stuff in the world of science. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, so what is what are next steps? Do you have another study that you're working on right now? Do you plan to try to get approval to eventually test this in humans? Right, so the next steps we're working on at the moment, we just got a grant to do this next phase. And what we're tackling is the, the human stereocilin protein. 
We have developed all of this in the mouse, working with the mouse protein. So we want to do the same thing, see if we can split the human protein in the same way, use this signal sequence or address on both halves to deliver it to the right spot. And we want to test that, not in people's ears just yet, but we can grow sensory hair cells in a dish, in a Petri dish in the lab, and we can try it in those cells in a dish. And we can get these cells from, from stem cells derived from patients who carry the stereocilin mutations. So using that patient derived material, we can test the strategy in a dish. If it works there, then yes, with uh, some additional pharmacology toxicology experiments, I think we'd be ready to take that next step and go into clinical trials. And I know this is in the future, but who would you include in the clinical trials? Like, does, is there a particular age range or, you know, stage of life that you need to be in? <laughs> right. So that, that's a good question. And so one of the things that's worth considering here is patients who carry stereocilin mutations do not have profound hearing loss. They've got uh, moderate to severe hearing loss, and very often the standard of care is a hearing aid. And so I think the question for, for many of these patients is, would they consider a gene therapy treatment in place of or as an alternative to a hearing aid? Some might make that choice and, and opt for it, and, and some might think, oh, okay, I'm doing all right with a hearing aid. So I think that'll be a key question to, to figure out along this path. But to, to really get at what you're asking, who would be eligible, I, I think potentially, uh, patients ranging in age from, from children five or six years old up through adults. So, I mean, that's great then. That has the potential to help a lot of people if it has a positive outcome, for sure. Exactly. If we can show that it's effective and safe, then I think yeah. there's a good chance it could help a lot of people. Well, Dr. Holt, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your study. It's fascinating research. I wish you and your team a lot of luck with it. And just for closing, do you have a website that you can share that I can include in the, in the podcast description? So our viewers, if they want to learn more, they can go there. Sure. The name of the lab, it's www.jellyocholtlab. And I can spell that out for you. G-E-L-E-O-C, then my last name, H-O-L-T, lab. Dot com. Jellyocholtlab.com. Okay. And if you, if you guys didn't catch that, I will include it in the description so you can click on the link. Thank you, Dr. Holt. That was so interesting and enjoy uh, well, your holiday. It's a, yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Great. Talking Absolutely. To you. you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.